What is up, everybody? Welcome to another World Cup recap here on Touchline Talk. Before I jump in, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you scan that QR code right next to me, you can go to my Substack, become a subscriber there to get all of my written work delivered directly to your inbox. So be sure to check that out as well. Two more round of 16 matchups to talk about today. The first, France booking their spot, becoming the third team to advance. 3-1 win over Poland. A Poland team that had not been very fun to watch in attack so far this tournament, and that's putting it nicely, came out and really did put a little bit more emphasis on the attacking side, made this game more interesting, did not exclusively sit back and try and make France break them down, had chances in the first half, specifically the weird series of events that started with a huge save from Hugo Lloris. I think it was two different deflections sort of on the line after that, where the ball was pinging around in the box. Poland definitely took some attacking initiative and tried to create chances when they had the opportunity. Of course, they're also trying to stop this French attack and were ultimately unsuccessful in doing so. It took France a while to get going. But they get the goal from Olivier Giroud, and that just kind of kickstarts everything. Makes Giroud the leading goal scorer in the history of the French men's national team, which is just an incredible thing to think about. But congratulations to him. You know, so much is talked about. He didn't score at the last World Cup. Personally, I really could not care less about that. He was really important to what France did. I will continue to believe, and I'll say it for the first time here. I buy into the, they very well might be a better team with him at the number nine position than Kareem Benzema. I haven't seen, of course, we don't get to see Benzema in this tournament. I haven't seen enough of Benzema and Mbappe together to make a conclusion about that. All I know is that France is, you know, I guess, technically not undefeated. But France has come, been successful, more or less. In every World Cup game, Mbappe and Giroud have played together. Right. They had the loss to Tunisia that was not because of those two players. Those two players did not feature prominently. France was resting players. That's got to count for something. You compare that to what happened at Euro 2020. And so, of course, you're never going to think Giroud when you think greatest strikers in the history of the French men's national team. But this is a testament to his value, both his goal scoring and the other stuff that he does that lets... Dembele and Bappe thrive in this team that really sets this French side up for success. And again, won it in 2018. Pretty easy getting to the quarterfinals in 2022. I mean, yes, you had the one loss that really didn't mean anything. It's got to count for something. And speaking of Mbappe, I mean, what more can you say about this guy? He scores two gorgeous goals. Could have had a couple other opportunities. Shout out to Matty Cash. A couple last-ditch tackles after he sort of got beat the first time. He was able to recover and stop Mbappe from running away from him. You know, they said during the broadcast that Mbappe's top speed, if you were able to sustain it, was something like a 3-8-40, which is preposterous. I mean, and his, his finishing ability, it's not like he's just speed. You saw what he can do with the ball at his feet. He's the best player in the world at the moment. He showed it in this game. He's showing it in this World Cup and has put any conversation about sort of the pressure and the disappointment of Euro 2020 to, to bed. It was a tournament that didn't go well for whatever reason. Clearly, this is not bothering him at all because he is thriving in this tournament. He's been absolutely incredible with sensational in this game and leads France to a fairly easy victory. A couple other things I want to mention quickly about this game. Robert Lewandowski does get a goal at the very end for Poland. Misses the first penalty. It was a rather embarrassing effort that Hugo Lloris was on top of, except for Lloris left his line early. So then Lewandowski did the exact same thing, converted it after Lloris left his line again, but it didn't matter because Lewandowski converted that one. So he gets another goal right at the end of his World Cup. And we almost, on top of the two goals Mbappe scored, had two incredible overhead kicks in this game. One from Giroud did go into the back of the net. 
it was chopped off for a foul. There was the whole conversation about the referee probably should have let that go and sent it to VAR. I do think that was a foul, so it it probably wasn't going to count. But it was almost a spectacular goal, the kind of goal that you see Giroud score, you know, once a year or something like that and remind you how good his best goals are. And then Lewandowski did something similar that hit off the woodwork. So we almost got a quartet of goals that will be unmatched in this tournament. Only two of them end up actually counting. Those are Mbappe's. France get the easy win. Their opponent in the quarterfinals, none other than England. England cruise to a 3-0 win over Senegal. Sort of similar how these games played out. England not doing anything going forward early in this game. Two mistakes, one by Harry Maguire, one by Bukayo Saka. Set Senegal up for really good scoring chances. Jordan Pickford comes up with a huge save on off of the Saka mistake. And then just kind of out of nowhere... Jordan Henderson pops up with a goal. Jude Bellingham, who was also great in this game, sets him up. Harry Kane does his connect everybody together with his number 10 slash number 9 thing to sort of hold the ball up and get that thing going. So they get the first goal. Kane gets his first of the tournament right before halftime to make it 2-0. That was kind of that. Saka adds a third. And Senegal never looked like they were going to get back into this game. Their best chances came when it was nil-nil. They didn't take advantage, and England just got better and better as the game went along. So there really isn't too much to say about this result overall. The thing I want to focus on, though, I'm still trying to make sense exactly how I feel about what England has done so far and what it means moving forward. Because go compare what they are doing to the path they took in 2018. They are scoring all kinds of goals in different ways. It's not just set pieces. It's not just sort of crosses from the the outside backs. I mean, and a lot of this has to do with Jude Bellingham, who is just destroying people in the middle of the field for the most part. The U.S. was able to stop them, but other than that, they're scoring, you know, three goals a game. That is a completely different situation than what they did in 2018. At the same time, that U.S. team made them look really feeble going forward, and that was a good England lineup Gareth Southgate put out. And so the question still remains for me, because we've seen it happen twice now. If they get a lead against a France or hypothetically in a semifinal or in a final, against an elite team, which is basically all they're going to be playing at this point forward, barring something incredible. What happens if they go ahead 1-0? Because it's, it's one thing to do what they did in this game against a team they are much better than player, to, player by player, who wasted chances early, and then you get your first goal and you just build off of it. It's something else entirely, if you go up 1-0 and you've got Kylian Mbappe coming at you, that is the, in terms of the pragmatism and the criticisms of Gareth Southgate, that has been the sticking point. That has been why they've exited the last two major tournaments without actually winning them. We still don't know the answer to that question. But you also have to recognize how good this team has been in attack so far this tournament. And it's a little bit, and the other thing I said from the very beginning, right? It's a little bit of everybody. One of the major problems this team has had through Nations League and going back to the couple recent major tournaments, you're just not getting goals from other players. It's Harry Kane, it's your center backs, it's your outside backs. You know, Luke Shaw got the one in the Euro 2020 final. But the Phil Foden's, the Marcus Rashford's, the Jaden Sancho's in the past, the Bukayo Saka's, the Jude Bellingham's, the Jack Grealish's, weren't getting you goals. Jordan Henderson pops one in this game. Saka's got three in the tournament. Marcus Rashford was the best player on the field, and it was a surprise he didn't start this game, though I actually think I like the decision Gareth Southgate made. You got guys contributing all over the place, and now you're going to also have the ability to start integrating James Madison if you need something different off the bench. Maybe Grealish sort of gets going again at some point. But you got all kinds of threats out there. And that is what is different, and that is what has to be acknowledged at this point. 
I picked this England team to beat France. I'm sticking with that because I, I do think the pragmatism, this is where it's going to pay off. The ability to balance the two. That has been the problem, and this team looks best positioned of the 2018 team, the 2020 team, and this team. This one looks the best position to be able to find that right balance between the two. But we're just not going to know until we see what happens if England has a lead by a goal against a team that has a similar talent level to them. France is the first opportunity we're going to get to answer that question. So it's fair to still be asking the same things about this team and to be not completely convinced. But the narrative coming into this quarter, this incredible quarterfinal matchup is completely different because so many of the, the things you can point to is where they have fallen short over the past four years, be it the Nations League or at the major tournaments. That stuff is gone. They can still score off set pieces, but they don't have to. They're not exclusively reliant on keeping clean sheets and trying to find a way to get a goal. They're scoring, you know, two, three, four against pretty good teams. The one game they didn't score a goal, they were able to keep a clean sheet. Now, they didn't play well, but they did keep the clean sheet. And, you know, Harry Maguire made a bad mistake in this game, but other than that, he's been really good this tournament. All of that stuff is sort of looking more and more like this England team is going to make a real run at this, and I feel good about my prediction they're going to beat France. There's also the fact Kylian Mbappe is on the field. This should be a sensational game. So, uh, yeah, I'm really just... There's only so much we can learn until we start getting these matchups. And it seems like, at least so far, we've got some excellent quarterfinal matchups where we're really going to start learning about some of the favorites in this tournament. Argentina, France, England. You can throw the Netherlands in there. I, I consider them a tier below these other three teams, but certainly they can beat Argentina. They're a better test than Argentina's gotten so far. So we're going to really start learning some things, and this is setting up to be a remarkable quarterfinal. England, France, your two most recent teams to advance. That is all for this World Cup recap. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time.